In the kingdom of Silvare, an old king is about to pass on. He tells the people gathered around his deathbed not to look worried. One of them wishes for him to recover and help the people. He says it is the end, and he has handed the rest to them. As he passes on, the king, Inglis, sees divine Alistia. He tells her how he hoped to see her one last time before he dies. Alistia commends him for his efforts in serving the people. He says it wouldn't have been possible to found the kingdom in a single lifetime. She touches his hand, and notes it to be his good heart that earned him the title of the hero king. She says she made the right decision in making Inglis her divine knight. She says she came around to pay him for his good deeds. Alistia asks Inglis to tell her any of his wishes, and she'll fulfill them. Inglis thinks about the request and says he wishes to be reborn. Inglis wonders how far he'd have gone with the way of the sword if he hadn't taken up the title to be the king. Alistia tells him that his wish has been granted. She says she looks forward to their reunion in the distant future, once he has been reincarnated. A baby opens her eyes and is lifted by her father, Luke. Her mother, Serena, calls her Inglis. Inglis realizes that he has been reborn. He is glad he has the same name as his past life. He looks at Serena, his mom, and likens her beauty to that of Alistia. He stares at the mirror and he hears his parents refer to him as a girl. Inglis realizes he has been reincarnated as a girl so he freaks out. Inglis's mother puts her to sleep and walks out of the room. Inglis gets up and stares at the swords on the wall. She complains of not being able to swing a sword immediately. Inglis confirms her divine blessings. She says she can feel the ether within her. Ether is the foundation of all creation in the world. Having control over ether means exerting one's will over the world itself. It is in essence known as divine powers. Ignis wished she had enough time to master the fundamentals of ether in her past life. She floats out of her basket and hears the cries of someone telling the magikite beast to be attacking. Serena enters the room and sees her afloat for a split second before falling back into her basket. She dashes to her basket and meets Inglis crying. Serena concludes to be seeing things and calms Inglis down. Serena runs towards the castle while carrying Inglis. Inglis gets excited when thinking of the magisite beats. She hopes they are strong foes. Serena gets to the castle gate and meets Arena her friend. Irina informs her that Raphael is looking after Rafinha. They go into one of the castle rooms and meet Raphael, Rafinha's eight-year-old brother. Irina picks up Rafinha while Serena goes to the window to watch the monsters. Inglis notes the magikite beast to vary. She suspects them to contain the power of condensed mana. Inglis is excited and wishes to face the monsters, but she ends up crying and misinterpreted to be scared of the monsters. Raphael feels sad due to not being allowed to combat the beast despite receiving a rune. Runes are needed to wield weapons known as artifacts that allow combat against magikite beasts. They are the mark of all knights. Irina tells Raphael about how special his rune is. She says his rune gives hope to people and he mustn't fall. She urges him to survive no matter what. A magisite dragon breaks into the room and sends Irina flying. Raphael tries to draw his sword, but Serena gives him his baby sister and Inglis to hold. She tells him to take the babies and run. She draws her sword and fights the dragon. Inglis sees how good her mother is with the sword, but notices the agility of the dragon to be a problem. Raphael creates a barricade around the baby and offers to fight the dragon. Serena tries to scold him, but he disagrees. Raphael tries fighting the dragon alongside Serena, but the dragon knocks them away. Chris crawls toward the dragon and uses Aether Strike to blow off the dragon. She giggles but gets spotted by Raphael who collapses shortly after. She falls asleep while noting that a baby's stamina isn't meant for battle. Chris wakes up and sees her dad talking to her mother. She says everyone is fine, thanks to Raphael. Luke talks about tightening security. He says if a prisoner attacked them, they'd be done for. Chris grins after hearing a monster is very strong. Five years later, Chris stares at herself in the mirror so much that it makes her mother uncomfortable. Irina is amazed by how intelligent Chris is. She asks Serena for the kind of lessons that made Chris to be smart. Rafinha meets Chris and says they should work hard at practice. During sword practice, Rafinha struggles to maintain her balance while lifting a wooden stick, and she falls. Chris runs to her and explains the stance she should take when trying to wield a sword. Raphael, who is now 13, easily beats his opponents during practice. Chris notes her father is the only person who can stand up to Raphael. She says she'd love to spar with Raphael someday. A fellow man walks in with a group of soldiers. Luke introduces them as the Rambach Company. He informs his people that the Rambach Company has joined them for a mock duel. Rambach introduces his son, Rawl to Luke and Chris. Rawl fights against the knights and beats ten of them. He mocks them for not trying their best. Chris notes Rawl to be using magic. She suspects him of restricting anyone who makes eye contact with him. Rawl hinders his opponent's movement slightly and goes for the strike. Chris is surprised that no one can tell how Rawl is using magic. She suspects the people of the present era have lost all knowledge and concepts of magic. A wooden sword gets knocked out from a soldier's hand and Chris catches it. Rawl makes fun of the soldiers, and Chris offers to face him next. Chris walks to meet her cousin, Chris, and tells him not to look Rawl directly in the eye when they duel. She explains how Rawl's opponents become sluggish immediately after they see him. Rafinha asks Chris if her brother would win, and Chris reassures her. Raphael picks up his sword to face Rawl. He looks at Rawl's feet while fighting him. 
He overpowers Rawl for a while, till Rawl evades his attack and hits the wall. Rawl uses the opening and strikes him on the back, securing his victory. He makes fun of the knights, and Raphael feels ashamed. Chris walks to Rawl and asks for a duel. Rawl refuses her at first, but she teases him about knowing the secret to his success. Rawl gets uncomfortable and accepts her duel. Luke tries to prevent Chris from fighting Rawl, but he blackmails him by saying she'll report the vase he bought to her mother. Luke permits her to fight Rawl, and she takes her stance. The knights marvel at her good sword stance. Rawl tries using his magic to slow her movement, but she uses ether to dissipate his magic. Chris closes her eyes and parries all of Rawl's moves. Everyone watching is amazed at how good she is, and it makes Luke think of her as a prodigy. She evades Rawl and strikes him on the back, securing her victory. The soldiers cheer for her, and Rambach congratulates Luke. Chris sees her victory as a stepping stone. She aims to go higher since it's the reason she was reborn. One year later, Inglis and Rafinha go to the church to have their baptism. Rafinha dips her hand into a magic box and tells Inglis about how warm it is. Her mother scolds her not to talk during baptism. Baptism is a ritual that grants a person the rune needed to become a knight. Runes are divided into ranks special, greater, normal, and lesser. The more powerful the runes, the more the user is allowed to use powerful artifacts. Rafinha removes her hand, and a butterfly rune appears on her hand. Her dad notes it to be a greater rune. Rafinha shows her rune to Inglis, and Inglis congratulates her. Inglis is called upon to have her rune bestowed upon her. She recalls her mom, wishing for her not to have a special rune, because if she did, she would be forced to serve the nation. Inglis reassured her mom that she also doesn't want the special rune. Inglis walks towards the box, and puts her hand in the box. She is asked to remove her hand, and look at the rune on it. Inglis does as she's told, and informs the rest of them that she doesn't have a rune. They wonder if the baptismal tabernacle is broken, because she fits the criteria of getting one. Inglis says she uses ether, not mana, since she's a divine knight. When the rune was about to be imprinted on her, she ended up deflecting it with ether. Luke worries about her not being able to become an official knight. He sees that he cannot have her succeed him as captain. She walks to meet her parents and apologizes for the disappointment. Inglis suggests she serve as Rafinha's squire. Her true goal is to be able to train on the front lines without being promoted. They agree to her suggestions and Rafinha hugs her while saying they'll be together forever. The prism flow is a phenomenon that turns wild animals, plants, and livestock into magicite beasts. It is a rainbow-colored rain that doesn't affect humans. The most powerful of the magicite beasts is the Rainbow King, also known as the Prismer. The Prismer is said to be capable of leveling a nation all on its own. Six years later, Chris and Rafinha walk through the Rainbow Rain. Chris complains about how weak the magicite beasts are, and wishes to fight a Prismer. Rafinha tells her that no one has seen it in their kingdom for 20 to 30 years. Chris says she'd love to go to the neighboring countries to fight the Prismers. The rain increases and Chris wishes it produces strong beasts. Rafinha wonders how Chris can take down the monsters despite not having a rune. Chris says she should remember to keep it a secret between them. The rain stops, and they see a highland float above their city. Highland is the home of the producer of the artifacts and baptismal tabernacles. The surface dwellers gift them crops and materials in massive quantities in exchange for the highlanders providing a means for them to fight against the magicite beasts. Chris notes the highland did not exist during her era. She sees Rafinha making a wish, and asks her why she's doing so. Rafinha says she was told that if one makes a wish when the highland is visible, it will come true. She urges Chris to make a wish. Rafinha wishes for her brother to be healthy in the capital. She asks Chris for her wish, and Chris wishes to fight a worthy foe. She advises Chris to wish for a wonderful boyfriend, and Chris doesn't want it. Rafinha gets happy and says she wants Chris to end up with her brother. Sometime later, the girls dress up for an event they were invited to attend. They talk about a Highlander coming with the capital inspector. Ronnie says an inspector comes by once, every two or three years, but it's the forest time they've been accompanied by a Highlander. Chris suspects the Highland to be planning on getting rid of the nobles to rule directly. They get to the party, and Chris clings on to Ronnie to avoid the gazes of men. They see Ronnie's father and he introduces the girls to Leon. Leon is a holy knight who serves alongside Raphael at the capital. He shows them his rune and apologizes for being the one who showed up instead of Raphael. Rain's father introduces the girls to Lord Shiny, the inspector. Rawl walks in, and he is introduced as the envoy from Highland. He showed them the stigmata on his forehead as proof that he was a Highlander. Chris realizes that one can be a Highlander even though they aren't born as one. Rawl tells them that he got the Highland citizenship by contributing lots of his money, and he needed connections with a Highlander to achieve the status. Chris tells him that she's not interested in the topic. Chris says she'd like to improve her sword skills. Rawl asks what good will it be for a runeless girl like her to do so. Leon interrupts them and says he'd like them to meet the ultimate artifact, a Hyrule Minas. They accompany him out of the party. Ronnie asks him if all Highlanders are like Rawl, and he affirms. He says Highlanders see surface-dwelling humans like them as a lesser race who can't protect themselves without the artifacts they are granted. He tells them that it's better to 
to just nod and smile at their unruly behavior. Ronnie gets mad and says Holy Knights shouldn't act like that. She says Holy Knights carry the hopes of everybody in the country, and the people will be helpless if they have no one to turn to. Ronnie realizes what she blurted out, and apologizes to Leon. He smiles at her and says she's like her brother. Leon takes the girls to meet Eris, his Hyrule Minas. Eris complains about not wanting to join the party, but when Leon tells her that he brought her visitors, she becomes curious. Leon says they are Raphael's relatives, and it makes Eris mad to the point that she slaps him and walks away. The girls are startled and ask Leon if they did something wrong, but he tells them it's fine. He tries to change the topic by telling them what Raphael has been up to, but they hear a scream. The three of them run back to the party and see the ground scorched. Leon asks Ronnie's father about what happened, and he says Shione got eliminated. Rawl explains to them that he slew Shione for failing to treat him with the respect he deserves. A knight cries and blames herself for Shione's demise. She says Rawl ordered her to visit his chambers, but she was unsure of what to say, so Shione stepped in between them. She says Rawl created flames out of nowhere and ended Shione. Chris notes it to be magic and suspects Rawl to be gifted magic by the Highlanders. Rawl tells Leonis to tell everybody that Shione got sick suddenly and died. He says if he uses his status to spread the rumor, they'll accept it. He says he can convince the king to believe Duke Bilford, Ronnie's father, for assassinating Shiny. He urges Bilford to sell out the female knight and make her do everything he wants her to. Chris voices how sick and disgusted she is towards Rawl. She says Rawl should give his word that he'll leave Ronnie and the female knight alone while she attends to him. Rawl agrees and asks her to come to the mansion alone where he is staying later. As he walks out of the party, he vows to break Chris and make her his. Chris leaves for Rawl's mansion and wonders what to do. She hopes Rawl has gotten stronger. Eris stands in her way and tells her to run away. She says she's been briefed by Leon. Chris refuses, and it makes Eris draw her weapon. Chris gets excited because she finally gets a chance to fight Hyrule Minas. The two of them clash and Eris sees how strong Chris is. She wonders how possible it is since she is runeless. Eris breaks Chris's sword and Chris gets grazed. She retreats and apologizes and it infuriates Chris. Chris asks her if she can see mana, and she says she can see it to a particular degree. Chris drops her sword and uses ether. Eris sees the level of mana and gives up on the fight. She urges Chris to take care of Rawl. Chris feels bad for showing Eris her mana because she wants to fight her for a long time. A lightning attack hits Eris and it sends her to a nearby tree. She gets up and identifies Leon to be the attacker. Leon steps out of the bush and it makes Chris wonder what's going on. Chris looks at the metallic gloves worn by Leon and suspects them to be an artifact. Eris asks him if he has betrayed them, and he confirms doing so. She thinks Leon sides with the Highlanders, but he tells her it's the opposite. He says due to what happened earlier in the party, he has confirmed how powerless he is against the Highlanders, and is ready to do whatever it takes to protect the people of the surface. Eris wonders how he plans to achieve such a feat since the Highlanders are the ones in charge of producing artifacts needed for slaying the Magicite beasts. Leon asks them if they have heard of the Bloodchain Brigade. Eris calls them an anti-Highland guerrilla organization that exists in other countries. She mentions how Highlanders have destroyed countries for killing one of their numbers. Eris believes the Blood Chain Brigade only spreads chaos. Leon corrects her that she only sees one side of the story. Leon says the real goal of the Blood Chain Brigade is to turn their blood into chains of iron and drag the Highland down to Earth. They plan to defeat the Highlanders and spread their technology among the people on the surface. Leon tells Eris that he wants to bring her with him to join the Blood Chain Brigade. He believes that through her, they can discover how to make artifacts without the Highlanders' help. Leon asks Eris if she'd still like to join him, but she refuses. She says she doesn't want to be involved in a plan that'll lead to the loss of multiple lives. Leon asks Inglis if she'd like to join but she refuses. Inglis says the reason she refused is to get a chance to team up with Eris and fight him. She says she understands his point but has stopped connecting power with justice. Leon says he saw her battle with Eris and he won't hold back when going against her. He creates multiple lightning beasts and commands two of the beasts to follow him, while he sends the rest to attack Inglis. Eris warns Inglis about the artifact being wielded by Leon. Inglis sees through Leon's strategy and tries attacking one of the lightning creatures. Eris sends flying slashes at the creatures, and they explode before Inglis touches them. She explains to Inglis why it's necessary to use long-range attacks against the creatures. Leon commends Eris for using the flying slashes to protect Inglis. He knows it to be a skill she cannot use multiple times. She fights with Leon while Inglis is. Preoccupied, Inglis amps herself with ether and attacks one of the lightning beasts. It explodes and makes Eris worry about her. Inglis appears to be unarmed after the impact. She explains to Eris that all she did was increase her defensive capabilities to a point where the explosion didn't have any effect. She destroys all the lightning beasts and joins Eris. Leon commends her for being incredible and notes that he or Eris can't handle her alone. He compares her with a prismer, and it makes Inglis tell them that it is her goal to take down one of the prismers on her own. The two knights see her as a nut job. Leon sees through Inglis's plans and plans to make her run out of stamina. 
He tries calling forth the monsters, but Inglis puts her leg between his artifact and it stops the process. Leon backs off and tries to create room to summon the lighting beasts, but Inglis appears and kicks him away. Ronnie jumps out of a building after being chased by a magicite beast. She falls to the ground and nearly gets stomped by the monster, but Inglis runs and hits the creature away. She asks Ronnie what happened, and Ronnie explains to her that she tried to help her in her plot to go against Rawl but she heard him scream and transform into the Magikite Beast. They are shocked because they've never heard of a human becoming a Magikite Beast. Leon gets up and says he drugged Rawl. He brings out a drug and calls it Prism Powder. Prism Powder is made of condensed prism flow created by the Blood Chain Brigade. He says the drug is ineffective against surface people, but it works on Highlanders. Eris asks him if Rawl can be cured, but Leon says he can't. He creates two lightning beasts and uses them to escape from them. Ronnie is confused and asks Inglis about Leon but she says she'll explain later. Inglis walks toward the Magicite Beast slowly and thinks of how to end the monster in a single strike. She worries about the mansion and the town that'll be affected if she uses the move. Rawl attacks her, but she leaps into the air and sees a safe place to deal with the monster. The Duke and his knights arrive at the scene. One of the knights orders for evacuation, but Inglis tells her that Eris will be helping them out. Inglis grabs Eris and runs towards the monster. She tells her to follow her lead. They both kick the monster and it is sent flying out of the city. Inglis congratulates Eris and orders her to follow her lead. They arrive at the edge of the city. Eris asks Chris why she wants her to kick the monster with her. Ronnie explains to her that Chris doesn't want anyone to know about her, who is a runeless person, being able to kill magicite beasts. Chris jumps down and gathers ether into her palm. She condenses it into a sphere and unleashes it on the monster. She wipes out the monster and clears the land in front of her. Eris and Ronnie are amazed by her power. Chris falls and it makes Ronnie worried. She tells Ronnie that she's tired and Ronnie is right about the prayer being said to the Highlander. She smiles for being able to face a tough opponent. The next day, Eris tells the girls that she plans to report Leon for Rawl's demise. Chris tells her to tell everyone that she was the one who defeated the Magicite Beast. Eris tells Chris that she owes her and she should repay the debt someday. Chris asks Eris what made her upset during the party. Eris apologizes and tells them that she doesn't want to tell them and she doesn't want people to find out. Three years later, Chris dodges all of Ronnie's arrows on the training ground. Ronnie tells her that she's been able to double her arrows and Chris commends her. The two of them head towards the capital to enroll in the Knights Academy in Kiral. The Duke tells Inglis to take care of Rafinha. In the town of Nova, Chris and Ronnie gather information about the head of the town from the bar attendant. They are told the ruler is a Highlander. Chris worries about the town, but the bar attendant assures her that the town is safe. The two of them wolf down the food prepared for them in the restaurant. They worry about their savings, and it makes the attendant advise them to work at the capital. She says their rule is hiring knights and mercenaries to help with magicite beast attacks. The two of them agree with her suggestion and head to take the hiring exams. After passing the hiring exams, the girls have their baths and recall the good things they get to enjoy. Chris notices Mana to be slowly sapping away from everyone's feet. The magistrate, who is a Highlander, enters the shower with them. Three other orphans do likewise. They all have a soak in the huge bath. Chris asks the magistrate if she knows anything about the mana that is being sucked away slowly from everyone, but the magistrate denies it. Chris hopes the persons or monsters doing such are strong and wishes she gets to fight them someday. The magistrate asks them how long they plan on staying. The girls say they won't stay long since they'll soon head to the capital to enroll at the academy. She asks the girls to help her defeat the knights of the old ruler. She calls them a wicked bunch who have been attacking people lately. She wants the girls to deal with them before something bad happens to the townspeople. She tells them their hideout, and they agree to her request. They head to the hideout and see about a hundred men belonging to the knight leader of the old ruler. They surround the men of the new magistrate, including Inglis and Ronnie. Ronnie points her now to fire dozens of arrows at the enemy, but her arrow gets repelled by a spear. The user of the spear jumps from a nearby building and speaks down on Ronnie. Chris compares the girl's intensity to be like that of Eris. She concludes the red-haired girl to be a Hyrule Minas. Chris smiles and calls it a fortune that a Hyrule Minas is among her opponents. Ronnie points her arrow at the red-haired lady, but Chris comes to her front and points at the red-haired lady. Chris tells Ronnie to protect the magistrate and the remaining knights while she handles the Hyrule Minas. Ronnie tells Chris that she can see how happy she is. The Hyrule Minas sees Chris in front of her and thinks it's some kind of joke, but Chris converts her ether into mana, and it makes the Hyrule Minas react. The magistrate, Lady Seelan, feels how strong Chris's mana is and asks Ronnie about it. Ronnie fires her arrows into the sky and it rains down upon the enemies. Chris asks the Hyrule Minas not to hold back. The two of them talk about how bored they've been and have been wanting to fight an actual battle. The Hyrule Minas asks Chris to unsheath her sword, but Chris says it won't be necessary. She attacks Chris with a spear, but she evades it at a hair's breadth. She throws multiple jabs at Chris, but Chris evades them effortlessly. 
Chris gets closer after every attack sent to her until she pins the Hyrule Menace to the wall and punches her. The red-haired lady gets up with the will to fight, and it astonishes Chris. She asks Chris why she serves a Highlander because her kind is trying to steal away the surface. Chris says Salen seems to be a nice person who is loved by the townsfolk. The Hyrule Menace asks Chris if she noticed something wrong about the town. She urges Chris to look into the matter. Chris says she isn't in the town to play hero and she's simply returning a favor after being overfed. Hyrule Minas asks her about the use of power if there's no justice. Chris replies that she gets to have fun. The red-haired gets mad at Chris and uses her ability with her spear. She attacks Chris with the spear, and it grazes her by the waist from behind. Chris sees that her attack neglects distance. The two go head-to-head -head and Chris grabs her spear. The Hyrule Minas kicks Chris in her wound. She attacks Chris with her might, but Chris amps herself with ether that deflects the red-haired lady's spear. She dashes instantly and hits her in the gut with her foot causing the Hyrule Minas to collapse. The Minas feels bad and wonders how she'll get to face her people. Ronnie enters, and the Minas grabs her by the throat while using her ability. She asks Chris to let her go if she values Ronnie's life. Chris tells her to leave, and she jumps off. Chris looks at her with bloodlust and tells her that she's a dead woman if she ever hurts Ronnie again. The Hyrule Menace asks for her name, and she tells her it's English Yukus. She calls herself Sistia Rouge before jumping off. Chris runs off to meet Ronnie to check if she's hurt. Ronnie tells her that Selin and the others are fine. Later that evening, Silen thanks the girls and informs them that she plans on persuading the night leaders to assist her in ruling the town. Ronnie sees her as a kind-hearted person. The attendant serves them tea and they note it to be sweet. Selin takes them downstairs and they see giant magic formations. The magic circles gather mana from the surface into it. Selin confirms Chris's guess and says, once the circle is done gathering mana, some lands of the surface will break and it'll float into the air, becoming a highland. She has been sent to rule the town to get the surface to become a highland. She plans to convince the highlanders to let the people of the town live and not become slaves or highlanders. Ronnie asks her why she is telling them of her plans, and Selin says she wants them to know if it's okay for her to rule the town. She asks them to strike her down if they feel otherwise. Ronnie turns to Chris to ask for her opinion, but Chris says she is the one being referred to. Chris says she'll go along with anything Ronnie says. Ronnie tells Selin that she wishes to believe her, and that she'll help her if she ever needs help. She says she's going to the Knights Academy to study hard and be of more help. Selin hugs her for being so kind, and Chris tells her that they might get to fight a Highlander army if things go well. At night, Selin goes outside weakly and transforms into a Magicite beast. Ronnie, Chris and the guards of the town run out to check what made the noise. They see the crest on the beast's forehead and wonder if it's Selin. Ronnie wonders how it happened since there wasn't any prism flow. Chris reminds her of how Rawl got transformed into a magicite beast by the Bloodchain Brigade's prism powder. They hear a maid laugh at Selin and curse Selin for losing her child to a Highlander. Selin attacks the city with beams and the guards look for how to evacuate the people. Chris tells Ronnie to block Selin if it looks like she's about to fire her beams. She dashes out of the city to deflect her attacks. Silen tries to attack the city, but Ronnie stops her from firing beams from one of her hands. Silen tries to fire a beam from her other hand, but she gets stopped by Chris. A figure lands by Chris to attack Salen, but Chris stops her. She sees it's Rouge, and confirms Rouge to be from the Blood Chain Brigade. Chris believes Mimosa, the maid, wouldn't have gotten her hands on the prism powder if she had defeated Rouge. A dark cloaked figure appears behind her and tells her otherwise. He says all his comrades carry the prism powder. The figure introduces himself as the leader of the Blood Chain Brigade. He tells her of how the plan to use banished knights to attack the Highlander failed, so Mimosa took action on her own. He says he has come to protect the people of the land, but eliminate the Highlander. Salen leaps out of the land to attack the city, but Ronnie stalls her. Rouge leaps to attack Salen, but Chris tries to punch her off. The leader blocks the attack and it surprises Chris that someone can exist that can take her ether shell enhanced fist. She tells the leader to step aside, but he refuses. She goes on the offense and he parries all her blows. Rouge seizes the opportunity to attack the Magicite beast, but Ronnie stops her. Rouge declares to take Ronnie out first. The children from the orphanage call out to Selin asking if she is alright. This causes her to point her arm at them. The beams charge up and the fighters try to protect the children, but Selin stops herself and points the beam to her face. Chris knocks the beam into the sky. She tells the Blood Chain Brigade members that Salen's consciousness is still in the beast, and she'd like to try something. She asks the Brigade members to help distract her, and if her plan fails, they are free to do what they want with Selen. The leader strikes a deal with her by asking her to leave the city when everything is over. He tells her that he plans to destroy the Levitation Circle, and he doesn't want her to interfere. She agrees and apologizes that she won't be able to fight him. The leader gives Ronnie and Rouge the command to distract Selin, while Chris leaps off and converts all of her ether into mana. She controls the mana and converts it into a casting spell. She freezes Selin, and it shocks everyone. Chris complains about not being able to move Selin due to her large size. The leader of the Blood Chain Brigade steps in and shrinks her into a small ice fragment. He hands it over 
over to Chris and tells her to go. Ronnie asks them if they won't do anything to the townsfolk and they promise not to. The next morning, Chris and Ronnie show what Salen got turned into. They tell the children that they'll find a way to bring her back, so they should make sure they are together till they await Salen's return. The girls leave for the capital and wave goodbyes to the children. On the way, the ice melts and Salen becomes a little creature. Ronnie gives her the name Lynn. She sighs when she thinks about who was right in the end since the brigade helped the people. Chris tells her not to think about it since the only goal she has in her mind is how to get stronger. The girls arrive at a church. They see a large prismal that has been frozen. Ronnie tells Chris that the people built a cathedral over the frozen prismal to watch over it since they couldn't move it. Chris talks without any consideration of the church they are at. She says she can feel the power of the monster inside the ice pulsing. A man calls out to them and tells them that there's been sightings of magicite beasts. Chris runs out of the cathedral and heads towards the town square. She sees a lot of the magicite beasts being ended off by knights. One of the creatures flies in her direction to attack her, but she prepares herself to end it. A girl runs past her and ends the creature. The girl turns to Chris and says it's suicide to try fighting a magicite beast without a rune or artifact. Chris analyzes the girl's movement and sees that she isn't ordinary. She sees the girl as having a greater rune similar to that of Ronnie. Chris tells her she'll be alright. Some rat-looking magicite beasts charge at them but the purple-haired girl manifests a sword and kills them off. Chris sees a flying beast and informs the girl about it. She tries cutting it but it evades. Chris leaps into the air and punches the creature down for the girl to end it. The girl realizes Chris can hold out on her own and apologizes. Chris tells her she's Inglis Yukis and the girl calls herself Leone Olfa. The name sounds familiar to Chris. They work together and finish off the creatures. Ronnie joins them and shoots down the last of the magicite beasts. She complains to Chris for running off without her. Chris introduces them to each other, and Leon realizes Ronnie to be Raphael's younger sister. She tells Ronnie of how Raphael helped her. The town knight thanks the girls for helping slay the monsters. He says he'll give only Chris and Ronnie rewards. Ronnie tries defending Leone, but she is called a relative to a traitor. Chris and Ronnie remember her brother to be Leon, a holy knight, who joined the Blood Chain Brigade. Ronnie rejects the reward due to the unfair treatment being given to Leon. They see a gear fly over them and land. Raphael gets out and speaks to the town knight for maltreating Leon. He gets embraced by his sister before realizing she's there. He sees Chris and notes her to be a fine lady. Ripple. A Hyrule menace notices Raphael complimenting Chris and is surprised due to how dense he is around girls. Raphael introduces Ripple to the girls. Rani asks him what he has been doing so far and he agrees to discuss with them while they eat. He invites them all to a bar to dine with him. At the bar, Leone notices how much the girls eat. Ronnie tells him everything that has happened to them so far. He is surprised that they are still alive. After coming across the Blood Chain Brigade's leader, Chris asks him if he knew about the Levitation Circle and still handed the city over to the Highland. They introduce Lynn, the magistrate of the Nova City who is now a magicite beast. Leone notes her to be cute, but she jumps into her chest. Ronnie asks why the knight had to be a jerk. Leone says it happens all the time and she can't think of their bad behaviors when the magicite beasts are attacking. She tells them not to have high hopes for the townspeople since they are the same person who praised her brother for being a holy knight. Leon says her brother killed a Highlander and an inspector. Ronnie interrupts her and realizes that Leon has been blamed for Shione's death. Leon hears them talk about her brother and asks if they've met them. They tell her they have and say her brother is easy to talk to. Leon vows to become a full-fledged knight so that she can capture her brother. Raphael tells them that to be a full-fledged knight, one must enroll at the Knights Academy. The girls smile after hearing that Leon will be enrolling just like them. Leon raises the topic of how magicite beasts appear all of a sudden in that town. She hopes the problem can be solved. Raphael tells her not to worry about it. A while later, the frozen prismer is being lifted off by a bunch of flying gears. Raphael suspects the prismer to be what has been drawing the magicite beasts. With the prismer gone, the town is meant to be free of the creatures. Ripple calls Chris to speak with her. She confirms Chris to be super strong based on Eris's information. She tells Chris that only the Hyrule Minas know about her strength and they are keeping it a secret. Ripple tells her about the prismer that is being lifted. She says it chose to seal itself decades ago and she was there when it happened. She tells Chris that the prismer will soon revive so they are moving it to watch it. Chris gets upset and asks Ripple to promise to call her in case the prismer revives so she can fight it. Raphael says his goodbye to the girls and tells them that he and Ripple are in charge of supervising the transportation of the prismer. In the capital city, Kirill, at the Knights Academy, Prince Wine addresses the freshmen in the hall. After his speech, the students are taken outside and introduced to the principal, Miliera. They see how young she is, but Chris tells Ronnie to look at the back of the principal's palm closely. She sees Miliera bear the special rune. The rune classes Miliera's strength to be on par with that of a holy knight. Some of the students gossip about Leon who is the younger sister of a Highlander killer. Ronnie tries to clear the air but Chris stops her and informs her that the principal is still talking. Miliera starts their orientation by lifting the ground where they are upwards. She confirms that the students did not have their artifacts before using a powerful gravity field on them. 
Miliera starts the drill by making the students face some golems she created within 10 minutes. She tells them that if anyone doesn't get tagged by the golem by the time it's over, then the person will have a free one-month cafeteria food. She starts the counter, and Chris knocks out the monsters immediately. All the students in the ring rejoiced, because none of them were tagged. Miliera makes them repeat the drill, but Chris knocks them out again. Miliera meets up with her and says she'll give her three months free worth of cafeteria food if she stops knocking the golems off the podium. Chris says she should include her two friends, and Miliera strikes a deal. The third time, the students are to run from the monsters while being suppressed by the gravity field. Many of them get knocked out, but Chris evades all the monsters till the end. Miliera congratulates her and announces that she gets the free meal tickets. Chris agrees to answer all her questions so far as she keeps her promises. At night, the girls return from the cafeteria with beaming smiles. They hear a girl complain to the principal about being roommates with the sister of a traitor. She asks the principal to re-examine if Leon is worth being a student. The principal asks if anyone is ready to have Leon as a roommate, and Ronnie says she is. Ronnie talks about all the good things Leone has done for the people who insult her and how she never for once talked back at them. She grabs Leone by the hand and leads her to her room. In the room, Ronnie sleeps, and Leone talks about how most of the time she usually is alone. Chris reassures her that she won't be alone anymore since they are friends. Leone gets teary-eyed and thanks Chris. At the cafeteria, the girls have plenty of meals and commend the meat for being good. Rati, a squire student, just like Chris, enters the cafeteria late and is scolded by his knight. Pram. He sees the amount of stacked plates on the girls' table and wonders how they can eat so much. He speaks to them and introduces himself and his knight. They all do likewise while showing their runes. Roddy sees the people staring and wonders why, but Leone answers that it's because of her. He says stuff like hers doesn't bother him since he isn't from around their country. He tells them he and Pram are from Alucard and they are transfer students. Pram reminds him that they have to finish eating due to class starting soon. Leone's former roommate frowns and leaves the cafeteria as she hears the bickering of the students. Margus, the freshman practical instructor, takes the freshmen to a practical class that involves them doing a flying gear exercise. He tells them how they are not only fighting magicite beasts, but also their limits and urges them to train their bodies. He starts their class by telling them to run towards the dock where the flying gears are. They see how fast he is and run after him. Chris stays behind and thinks of a way to train herself. She uses the gravity field spell on herself to increase her weight which the headmaster used on them the other day. Chris starts running and passes everyone. She meets up with Margus. Roddy joins her and Margus is happy about the potential of their class. Some other students close the gaps and Chris tells them that she'll be going ahead. Chris picks up the pace and runs ahead of the teacher. On getting to the dock, the flying gears are rolled out and the students are asked to get on board. Chris asks her team if she wants to pilot it. The students read the instructions in the flying gears and deploy them into the air. Chris sees Roddy's flying gear ahead of hers, and she gets jealous. She fires beams with ether. Roddy compliments her, and it makes Pram jealous. The students partake in different classes. The principal teaches them on the field. She calls some names and says they have been recommended by the night program. Inglis gets recommended by the squire program. The recommended students are going to be sent to different places, and if they make it back to the field before the time is up, they pass. Miliera says she'll be sending them into the labyrinth of trials with an artifact. The goal of the trials is to strengthen the student's mentality as knights. Pram declares to Chris that she won't lose to her. Miliera creates multiple doors and asks each of the students to pick a door. They all enter their respective doors. Chris walks into one and her memories appear in front of her. The further she walks, the further her memories of her life appear. She comes across memories of her past life and meets the man she entrusted to succeed her as a king. She says she doesn't like the memories because if she continues, she'll be bound to meet Alistia. She blasts a hole through the labyrinth and sees Lisa Lot another candidate on the upper floor. Chris realizes the labyrinth is connected, so she jumps into the upper floor and speaks to Lisa Lot. Lisa Lot talks about how Ronnie avoids her in class. Chris tells her that Ronnie is probably upset with her because of the way she treated Leona. Lisa Lot says she realized she went a little too far. Chris says she'll put in a word for her to Ronnie. Lisa Lotta says she hates the labyrinth because it brings back all her bad memories. They agree to leave their floor and go to the upper floor. Lisa Lotta uses her rune and grows out wings. She lifts Chris to the upper floor where Leon is. They see her about to engage in a battle with her memories. Her parents and a little version of her protect her brother from her. Leona has already expended a lot of mana. Chris and Lisa Lot assist her in clearing the memories. She asks them how they managed to get into her memory, and Chris says she broke her way in. Lisa Lot apologizes for being mean to Leon, and Chris tells Leon that Lisa Lot is a nice girl. She grows her wings and lifts them to another upper floor. The girls open a door and come out of the labyrinth. Miliera wonders why three of them exit a single door. Lisa Lot tries talking, but Chris shuts her and whispers that Miliera will make them take the tests again if she finds out about the truth. Miliera passes them and they see Prom who is being patted by Rati. Rati tells them Prom failed almost immediately when she entered the door. Ronnie is the last person to open the door. Her friends meet her and celebrate. 
great. Lisa Lada bows her head and apologizes to Ronnie for what she said about Leona. Chris, Ronnie, and Leona go to Lisa Lada's room to play with her. Lisa Lata welcomes Leone alone at first to tease the rest. She allows them in and they all hang out. The principal invites Chris, Ronnie, Lisa Lot, and Leone to her office. She informs them of a party Chris and Ronnie have been invited to attend. It is the appointment of a new Highlander emissary. Leone wonders why she is in the room, and Lisa Lata tells her that she'll be attending the party as well. The principal tells her that Lisa Lata's father, the Chancellor, will also be attending. Lisa Lot says she told her father that she'll be bringing a friend. Leone thinks of her position, but the girls urge her to come with them. She agrees, and the girls think of the clothes to wear for the party. The girls go to town to get some clothes. Ronnie tells them that her brother will be paying for the clothes. They hear a scream that says a Magikite beast is around them. On getting to the scene, they see Eris and Ripple who have defeated the beast and ask if the beast used to be a Highlander. Eris tells them it is a demi-human magicite beast. She says demi-humans are affected by the prism flow. Ripple says she's a Hyralmanus, so she is fine. They notice Ripple to be unwell, so they ask her about it. Ripple covers it up by saying she's just a little dizzy. Eris isn't surprised by her condition since it has happened before. She tells the girls that they have been through her case several times since returning to the capital. Eris says Ripple gets sick as soon as a magicite beast appears, and they do not know why. Ripple hands them money and says it's from Raphael. She tells them it's for tailoring their dresses. She says Raphael got assigned a sudden mission so he couldn't come. The Hyrule Menace say they'd like to tag along with the girls as they shop. Several days later, the girls prepare to go to the party. They dress elegantly and compliment themselves. The principal takes them in a carriage. She tells them about how negotiations will take place to see if they can get the latest equipment. She tells the skeptical Lizalot that she's familiar with the new emissary. She talks of her past when she was on an exchange program in the Highland. The students are surprised and she tells them it was during the time Prince's Vine went there on exchange that she went as his bodyguard. Leon asks the principal if she can ask the emissary for information on the Bloodchain Brigade. Chris feels like he might know about it. She wants to gain information about the man in a black mask. Lisa Lotta says it might be difficult since they are academy students. Chris tells them to take it easy. They get off the carriage and Ronnie talks about how hungry she is. She runs and trips. Raphael picks her up and asks if she's alright. He tells her to be careful and not cause trouble for Chris. He sees how beautiful his cousin is and loses his words. He sees Lynn also accompanying them. Ronnie and Chris's tummies growl and they tell her brother that they haven't eaten. He decides to take the girls inside. The principal and the other girls choose not to accompany them so that they won't be grouped as a bunch of starving people. As the girls walk in, the men in the party look at Chris and adore her. Their stomachs growl, but Raphael claims to be hungry in front of everyone to take the fall. Raphael brings them to a table to eat, but a magicite beast drop down and destroy their tables. Chris grabs some meat despite the situation and chooses to quench her hunger first. She hands Ronnie one of the meat as they assess the situation. Chris tries to fire an attack on the beast in front of them, but Raphael quickly cuts it down. Inglis notices his improvement and commends him on it. She meets him and asks that they spar some time, but he says he doesn't want her to get hurt. The principal joins them and urges Raphael to take care of the monsters around the emissary and the chancellor. He runs off and tells Chris's team that he is leaving them in her care. The girls complain about having to fight in their dresses and the principal feels concerned because they aren't terrified. Chris used Ether Pierce to destroy the crystal on the head of a magicite beast, thereby killing it. The girls are scared due to how easy she made it look to defeat the monster. More magicite beasts pour into the dining hall, and the girls face them. Chris kills a lot of them with her ether pierce, but she notices herself to be slow, so she also uses her left hand to fire the attacks and it works. She calls Ronnie's attention and shows off her dual-wielding skills in wasting the creatures. After eliminating the creatures, they meet up with the principal to ask for permission to eat, and she grants them. The girls scavenge food and begin eating. Lisa Lot walks in and sees the monsters they've defeated. She tells them that her father is safe. She calls Rafinha and Inglis to follow her because she notices something is wrong with Ripple. The girls follow her, and they notice Ripple to be lying unconscious with the space around her distorted. Chris suspects the light around the distorted space to be what summoned the Magicite beasts, and she receives her confirmation. A general asks if Ripple summoned the monsters to attack them, but Rafinha defends her. Eris calms her down and says they must be ready for danger. Prince Wine speaks to Theodore, the Highland Emissary, if he has any idea what could have caused Ripple's illness. Theodore suspects it to be caused by the hierarchy. The principal explains the two factions of the Highlanders to the girls. One produces technology for the surface people, while the other is against the surface people from gaining technology. Theodore says Ripple was made by the hierarchy, and they might have prepared a way to destroy her from within. Eris wonders why the Hyrule Minas like her exist, since they are just built for the Highlanders' power struggle. Ronnie tells her that they are here to protect people, and the technology built by the Highlanders helps to move people who are far away faster 
and protect them from magicite beasts. The people in the room silently agree with what Rani said. After realizing that she is out of place, she apologizes to Eris, but Eris thanks her. Theodore tells Wine that he'll try his best to help Ripple. He walks toward Ronnie, compliments her looks and her words, and it makes Ronnie blush. Chris gets between them and introduces herself as Ronnie's squire. She introduces herself and Ronnie formally to Theodore, and it makes him realize that he is talking to the people who saved his sister. He tells them that Saline is his younger sister. The three of them go outside. Theodore thanks the girls for saving his sister, even though she got turned into a little magicite beast. He vows to turn her back. He stretches his hand to carry her, but she bites him and goes back to Chris's chest. He sees that she doesn't want to go with him and leaves her in Chris's care. A report comes to them that Ripple has woken up. Ripple gets up and tells them she's fine for the moment. She apologizes for hurting everyone and wonders why she chose to be a Hyrominus. She tells Wine to destroy her if he cannot find a way to stop her. He tells her that he cannot do much but will have her protected. Chris walks up to her and offers an idea. She asks that they bring her to the Knight's Academy, where the country won't lose soldiers guarding her. Rafa Raphael is against the idea because the academy is located in the middle of the city. He fears having the beasts cause havoc. Theodore suggests Ripple be at the academy, so that she can be studied by Miliera while trying to cure them. Chris sees this opportunity as a way of teaching the students how to fight the Magikite beasts. Wine agrees with the idea, and permits Ripple to go to the academy. The students run during their practical sessions. Margus sits on a flying gear that is carried by Chris. He urges his students to run faster. The special students all over the school are gathered by the principal and briefed that they are going to have Ripple, the Hyrule Minas. Silva Iron, a special rune owner, deciphers what the principal wants and tells everyone gathered that they are to protect Ripple and eliminate any magicite beasts that appear while ensuring that their vicinity isn't damaged. The principal praises him for his sharp intuition. Chris heard Silva to be the strongest student at the academy, and it makes her wish to fight him. The principal tells them that each grade member will form a team and will take turns protecting Ripple for a day. She provides them with artifacts and tells them to eliminate the monsters while creating barriers to prevent the monsters from destroying the vicinity. Theodore suggests that each of the team should have someone who can create a barrier by Ripple's side at all times. The students pick weapons they are familiar with, but Ronnie doesn't see a bow. Chris tries to take a weapon but Silva says there isn't any point in her doing so. He believes a runeless squire can't use the artifact. Ronnie tries defending Chris, but Chris tells her not to worry. Silva continues to blab about how having a runeless squire will put them in trouble. He also says he cannot entrust his life to the sister of Leon the traitor. Ronnie and Lisa Lada defend Leone. The principal stops them from arguing and tells Silva that he went too far. Ronnie suggests they battle out their opinions on whether they are worthy of the mission. Silva scoffs when she brings up the matter, but they hear Yua, a second-year squire, talk about leaving due to the opinion Silva expressed. The principal stops her and says she is needed for the operation. She agrees, and Chris suggests that they team up and face Silva. Yua rejects the offer immediately. She says she doesn't like bullying the weak. Chris asks the principal if Yua and Silva have ever fought before, and she confirms her guess. She says Yua won the battle, and since then, they've been like oil and water. The principal asks if there's a way Chris can make her two seniors see eye to eye. Ripple calls everyone's attention and apologizes for causing them problems. She collapses, and the space around her becomes distorted. The principal urges Theodore to leave Ripple's side and casts a barrier around them. The monsters appear, and Silva asks the principal if she can let the third years handle the monster for the day. The principal agrees, and Silva starts his formation. He tells the rest of the students not to lay hands on the monsters. Chris uses her leg and ends one of them. Silva complains, but she says she didn't break the rules he set. Other class members do the same and claim to mistakenly swing their weapons. Silva gets mad, but Ronnie tells him that the longer they take, the more pain Ripple will go through. The principal changes her stance and says everyone should get rid of the monsters. All the students fight off the magicite beasts as they spawn. Chris sees Yua move faster than her and defeat the monster ahead of them. She says she is under a gravity spell but notes Yua to be the fastest person so far. Chris tries convincing Yua to fight her, but she rejects the offer. They get rid of the monsters and see how the school building is damaged. Silva blames Yua and the rest of the students for not being able to hold back and handle the situation optimally. Yua asks for Inglis's name, but she forgets it immediately. Inglis decides to call her by her chest. The girls talk about the bad names given to them by Yua. They play chess and discuss what they do not like about Silva. Chris wins the game of chess. They ask Ripple if she'd like to play, but Ripple says she prefers physically challenging games. Chris hears this and proposes to fight Ripple. The girls scold her and tell her that they are to protect Ripple and not fight her. Ripple agrees to the challenge and it makes Chris's eyes twinkle with delight. They go and meet the principal to hear her say concerning the matter. Theodore hands Leon an artifact. 
He says they've concluded to move the students and the beast to a pocket dimension whenever the magicite beasts appear. This is to reduce property damage. Theodore asks Leon to open the dimension and have them test how strong it is. Leon wields the artifact and opens the pocket dimension due to her concentration. Inglis and Ripple battle in the dimension. Chris dashes at her and attacks her, but Ripple easily parries her punches. They go at it for a while, then Ripple manifests a gun. She shoots at Chris while maintaining a distance. Chris evades her bullets and creates an ice sword. She deflects Ripple's bullet and moves closer to attack her, but Ripple manifests a second gun and begins to dual wield. The bullet nearly lands on Inglis. The two of them go at it for a while till Chris deflects the bullet toward Ripple. Ripple evades the attack but is left open for Chris to strike. Chris sends her flying and she collides with the barrier put up by Miliera. She apologizes and hopes Ripple is okay. Ripple gets up and thanks Miliera for the barrier. Miliera explains to her that the moment she came in contact with the barrier, she absorbed it. Theodore comes up with an idea. He asks Lisalotta to use her artifact and Ripple is to touch it. Ripple touches the wings of Lisalot, but nothing happens. Theodore gives Lisalot's artifact to Miliera to hold. Wings grow at the back of Miliera, and when Ripple touches one of them, the wings get absorbed. Theodore concludes that Ripple's condition allows her to absorb mana from people with special runes. Ripple loses her composure and collapses on the floor, causing the space around her to become distorted. Leon tries holding on to the pocket dimension, but she loses control, and they end up back in the principal's office. The office gets destroyed by a gigantic magicite beast. The principal complains about her office desk being destroyed. Chris stares at the giant magicite beast with glints in her eyes. She compares it to being as strong as Rawl and Lady Cyrene's beast form. The monster charges up an attack, and Chris analyzes it. She tells them the magicite beast is about to fire a beam. The principal tells Chris to stop the monster. Chris kicks the beast far into the air. They worry about it crashing, but they see Yua not far from them. They call Yua's attention to the monster falling towards her, and Yua destroys it in a single strike. They are amazed at Yua's strength. Theodore addresses the girls in a room. He tells them that when Ripple absorbs mana from a special class rune bearer, the Magicite Beasts are summoned. Chris confirms from Theodore that it takes mana to summon the Magicite Beasts, and Ripple won't be able to summon the monsters again until she has mana. Leon asks Theodore why the Magicite Beasts Ripple summons are former Beastkins. Theodore suspects it to be because she's a Beastkin herself. The principal suspects Ripple to be able to call out others of her kin through her six senses. Ripple says she feels it's a good chance to put her kin who have become Magicite Beasts to rest. The students assure her that they'll prevent the Magicite Beasts from hurting anyone. Eris and Raphael inform them about the Venefix arm armies that have crossed the border, and Prince Wayne requests for Theodore's presence. Two weeks later, the girls have their baths in a large pool, and talk about how everywhere has been peaceful for a while. It makes Chris sad due to not having any strong opponents to fight. The girls wonder why Chris's looks can be so deceiving compared to her personality. Yua speaks, and Chris notices. She meets Yua and asks her to show her the chopping move she used to eliminate the Magicite Beast. Yua refuses and tells her she doesn't like moving. Chris asks Yua how she can convince her to teach her, and Yua tells her there's something she'd like to learn from her. Chris and Ronnie head to their room while complaining about how furious they made Lisalata to be. They see the principal waiting for them outside their room. The principal tells them to change into their uniforms and come to her office. Ronnie is handed an artifact. It is an upgraded version of her previous one, and it has a healing function. The principal informs them that Theodore says she should take care of Ripple. Chris looks displeased, and Ronnie asks her why she is always like that when it involves Theodore. Door. They hear an explosion nearby and head there. They see a huge magicite beast that has already been subjugated and note it to be strong due to the damaged property around it. The students tell them that Ripple's phenomenon occurred. They tell her of how they subjugated the monster, but Silva got hurt. The principal and the girls head towards Silva who rests on a rock. He tells them he is fine and they should take Ripple somewhere else. The principal orders the students to do what Silva said. Silva blames himself for the incident, but the others point at Lottie to be at fault. Lottie stands by the other side with Pullum. He apologizes and explains that Silva covered him when the beast was about to get him and it led to him being hurt. Pullum says Lottie tried covering for her so she's the one at fault. Silva's classmate blames them, but Silva tells him to stop since it's only natural for the strong to protect the weak. He loses consciousness, and the principal tells them to take him to the infirmary. Ronnie interrupts her and suggests she try her artifact on him. She concentrates and heals him a little bit, but it takes a toll on her. Chris converts Ether to mana, and supplies Ronnie to the point where she can completely heal Silva. The next day at the cafeteria, Chris and Ronnie have a very spicy dish. Pullum and Lati meet them, and talk about their use of spicy foods. Lati says he is from Alcard, a cold region in the north where they eat spicy foods to keep them warm. Pullum asks for rations, and Inglis says she'll give her, but when Lottie does, Pullum stops him. He listens to her and it surprises Inglis. He says he is sorry for the trouble he caused them. Pullum says he was just trying to help. He says he'll apologize to Silva. 
The girls tell Silva not to be angry with Lati, and wonder why. They assume Silva to be a person who doesn't like squires. Ronnie concludes that Silva likes men, since he is always gentle with Lati. Silva walks in and tells them to stop making assumptions about him. Lati apologizes for the incident that occurred the previous day. Silva tells him not to worry about it. He meets the girls and thanks them for healing him. Silva apologizes to them for his rudeness when they first met. He shakes hands with Ronnie, and it makes Chris come in between them while acting as a guardian. After their meal, Chris and Ronnie go to the principal's office after hearing her exclaim. They ask the principal for what happened, and she tells them that she has received a letter telling them that the royal guards are going to be the ones guarding Ripple from now on. They plan to take her back to the Highland and try to make a new hero menace. The principal disagrees with the letter and informs the girls that they will continue to guard Ripple. Ripple tells them that it might cost them trouble since they'll be confronted the royal guards. The girls and the principal say they are to guard her and advise her not to worry. Leon and Lisa Lot walk towards their dorm. They experience a prism flow downpour. Leone wonders what the principal plans to do for Ripple's sake. Lisa Lot guesses that she's probably buying time for Prince Wayne's help. Lisa Lot realizes it's a bad time since Prince Wayne is absent. She wonders if someone is behind their situation. A magicite rat runs toward them, but Leone attacks it. She sees her brother's lightning beast, and they follow it to a particular underground facility. They see Leon and he greets Leone. Leone dashes to fight her brother, but Lisa Lot stops her. She informs her about someone else's presence. Rouge showcases herself and a man in black robes walks out of the shadows. Leone sees him and calls him the Steel Blood Front. Leone engages her brother in battle. Lisa Lot tries to interfere, but Rouge stops her. The leader tells her that they do not want to hurt the child of the Arcia family. Lisa Lot wonders how the Blood Chain Brigade knows about her since she's only an academy student. Leone complains to her brother as they engage her about how their parents have left them. She says she'll never forgive him on behalf of the people of Almon. He tells her that if she loses Almon, she'll have nothing else left. The leader tells them that the royal court has decided to offer Almond to the Hierarch Highlanders to restore relations with them. He explains to them that Almond has outlived its purpose as a place from which the frozen prisoner is watched. The girls complain about it not being right, but Rouge tells them to direct their hatred at their foolish king. They explain that the Hyrule menace will be handed over in four days. They are told the emissary will be coming by boat. The leader tells them that they plan to kill the emissary since Highlanders are their enemies. Lisa Lot asks the Blood Chain Brigade why they are telling them their plans. The leader tells the girls that they are free to do what they want, but they shouldn't get in their way. The Blood Chain Brigade leaves the girls and Leon stops his sister from following him. He tells her what she thinks is best. He says seeing her all grown up makes him happy. They report the case to the headmaster and the special students. Chris comes up with a plan and explains it to them. Silva talks about how reckless Chris's plan is, and the rest of them agree with him. They decide to go with it nevertheless. Four days later, the girls dress up as maids to infiltrate the meeting. Miliera tells them they'll be handing Ripple over to the emissary, right after the ceremony at the court. She tells them that she and Silva will feed Ripple their mana to make her summon magicite beasts while the royal guards are busy protecting the court. Silva says he'll be counting on them to protect Ripple. The girls see his sincerity and mistake it for love. He corrects them that he respects Ripple deeply for saving his life when he was little. He explains how his friend, who was Runos, died protecting him. Ripple saved him and told him to get stronger to protect weak people like his friends. He says he trained hard every day and became who he is due to what Ripple told him. Chris asks him if Ripple is the reason he uses a gun artifact, and he confirms her guess. Silva remembers Ripple to be upset when she looks at him, and concludes that it's because he isn't strong enough. He urges them to carry out their plan to prevent Ripple from being taken away from their country. At night, the ship arrives and the girls play their roles as housemaids. Chris eats a little piece of each of the food she is to serve the guests. Ronnie mumbles about how it'll be a waste for the food not to get eaten due to the Blood Chain Brigade's ambush. Chris shushes her, and warns her not to mention the brigade so that they do not get roped up as accomplices. They see the King of the Land, Carius, and note him to have a special class rune. Ronnie suspects him to be strong and concludes that it'll be easy to protect him. Chris says that they do not know for sure. She believes that if he does his job as a king, then he won't have time to practice. The king addresses the people that their presence has been graced with an emissary from the Highland. He says the Highlanders promise to send a new Hyrule menace who will lead their kingdom to greater glory. Ronnie asks Chris why the king didn't mention Almond. She wonders if they do not have to hand it over anymore. Chris says in the condition they are, one must say the good things, not the bad. The emissary steps forward and the king urges everyone to be on their best behavior. Highlander Archlord Ivel is a young boy whose eyes and hair have pretty colors. Ivel says emissaries who get sent to the surface are low-level foreign officers. He brags about being a general who controls the low-level emissaries. The people clap for him while Ronnie tells Chris that she doesn't like him. He insults everyone in the room, and the king laughs and agrees. Carius calls himself the greatest fool, and asks Ivel to teach them how to be as smart as him. Ronnie hates the way everyone sucks up to him. Magicite beasts break into the room, and Chris deals with a lot of them. The people there see her and ask 
ask her for who she is, and she tells them that she's a maid who is doing her duty to clean up messes. Chris tells Ronnie to take care of the remaining monsters, but a monster gets taken out by Ivel. Chris notes not to be able to see the attack Ivel used. Some guards use the commotion to try and stab Ivel, but Chris stops them. Ivel asks her why she did, and it causes her to apologize. Ivel orders Chris to hold the guard. He creates light from his fingers and touches the guard's face hereby ending him. He speaks to the king and the king apologizes after explaining the case to have been carried out by the plot of the Blood Chain Brigade. The king grovels at Ivel's feet but Ivel cuts off his right arm. The king thanks him and stops his guards from attacking Evil. Ronnie asks Chris if what is happening before them is okay. Chris tells her that what she thinks is right is right. She notes that some pledge their loyalty to the Highlanders to keep their people alive, while others try to become stronger, to become equals to the Highlanders. Chris takes Ronnie to the king and reattaches his arm for her to heal. Evel sees them and asks what they are doing. They tell him what's happening and ask if it's okay. Evel says he is fine as long as he takes off someone else's arm. Chris offers her arm to be taken if it'll cost her a chance to view Evel's ability up close. He agrees with her with the hopes of seeing her scream. Chris analyzes Evel's technique and watches him try to cut off her arm. He grazed her clothes and it shocked her. He attacks her some more but cannot get past her defense. Chris realizes Evel to be using more than mana and Evel explains it to be mana refinement. He says it increases the purity and efficiency of mana. Evel wonders how a surface dweller can defend against it. He asks Chris who she is, and she says she's just a maid. He gets mad at her and asks her to attack him. The king stops Chris and says she mustn't harm a Highlander. Evil insults them and tells them that he didn't come to give them a Hyrule Minas. The king asks him for what he wants. The flying shot from the Highland lands on the surface and it makes Ivel smirk. The people wonder whose battleship landed and Chris suspects it to belong to the Blood Chain Brigade. Evil laughs and says the Blood Chain Brigade has fallen into their trap. He says they set up a fake ceremony to lure the brigade members to the open and exterminate them. The guards ask Evel why their king had to be humiliated and Evel says they are all worthless. Chris confirms the situation from Evel and asks the king to command her to strike Evel down. The king orders her not to kill Evel but to capture him alive. Chris agrees to take up his offer and am herself with Ether. Evel sees her as a threat and creates an annihilation field, and Chris tells him of his plan. Evel is surprised that Chris can see his force field. Chris tells him to concentrate his magic on one point to make it stronger and promises to attack him there. Evel doesn't believe her, and it makes Chris call him a coward. Evel concentrates his magic on his fist after falling for Chris's taunt, and she attacks him there. Chris breaks Ivel's barrier around his fist and sends him flying out of the hall. The Majesty orders the Knights to fight the Blood Chain Brigade to restore their ties with the Highlander. Chris asks Ronnie to join her, but Ronnie says she's tired from healing the king's arm. Chris grabs Ronnie by the arm and runs out of the hall. She holds Ronnie and leaps on flying gears while using them as footholds. They get close to the flying battleship. The battleship fires an attack on the capital, and it causes Ronnie to activate her artifact and fire her arrows to blind the ship. She orders Chris to stop the ship. Chris uses her ether strike on the battleship, but it gets deflected by the leader. Chris looks into the ship, but doesn't see Leon and Rouge in there. The leader orders his men to continue with the mission while he handles Chris. He jumps down and asks Chris for her plan to save the Hyrule Minas. She tells him that the principal and her friends from the academy are handling it. The leader of the Blood Chain Brigade asks Chris for the location of the Highlander. Chris confesses not to know Ivel's whereabouts. The leader says Chris has gotten stronger since they last fought. She says she hasn't been able to confirm it and would like to. The two of them amp themselves with Ether. Silva runs to his schoolmates and the principal to inform them of the troops that were escorting Ripple headed back to the castle. The principal asks the students not to participate if they do not feel like, and this makes Yua leave. The principal and Silva plead with Yua not to leave. Ripple joins them and asks Yua to help her. They get her to agree after a lot of dilly-dallying. The principal asks Leone to open her pocket dimension and she does. Silva informs the student that he and the principal plan to feed Ripple their mana to have her call Magicite Beasts. They prepare for the beast to appear. Chris fights the leader and she notices he is very strong. The leader creates a sword out of a compressed ether and attacks her. Chris admits not to be able to achieve such a feat. She evades her attacks and admits that she'd suffer huge damage if she got hit by the sword. Chris creates a weak sword to parry his blade and it halts his compressed sword of ether for a second, and she uses the chance to strike him in the chest. The masked leader is sent backward. Chris follows her attack with an ether strike, but the masked leader cancels out the attack. He sees that she's improving in battle. Chris tells him that while he has been busy, she's been focusing on training. Ronnie, on a flying gear, meets up with Chris and informs her of a strange figure approaching them. Ivel lands on the ship and Chris says she's happy he is doing okay. He complains that she was the one who kicked him into the sky. The masked leader sees Evel and realizes that he is the emissary. Evel speaks to the masked man like he knows his identity. He makes fun of his costume. Chris warns Evel, but he says it's exactly as he wants. Chris wonders why they have to fight. She says if she gets cornered to go against the two of them, she'd be delighted to. Rouge, on her flying gear, 
informs the masked man that she has connected the bridge. He calls Rouge to his side and asks for her help. Rouge agrees and transforms into a powerful spear. Chris is amazed and notes the spear to be absorbing ether and amplifying it. The students fight the magicite beast in the dimension. They fight to their limit while Silva and the principal pour out their mana into Ripple. Leone fights despite maintaining the pocket dimension. She reaches her limit, and they appear back in the forest. Two giant magicite beasts reach for Leon who is on her knees but they get attacked by lightning beasts. Leon walks in and tells the students that he is there to help them. He sees his little sister scowling and tells her not to be mad. He sees how spiteful they are and throws them a mana mist. The students and the principal recover their lost mana. Leon informs them that his boss asked him to help them. He recalls his boss telling him to do what he wants to do. Leon tells them that he has no choice but to help them. He asks his little sister to open up her pocket space and promises not to trick them. He joins Silva and the principal in feeding mana to Ripple. A bright light explodes from the academy's direction. It knocks out all the students. Leon wakes up in her brother's arms and asks him what happened. He tells her they summoned the unbelievable. Towering above them is a prismer. Chris sees it and her eyes gleam. Chris sees the prismer and marvels that it's alive and moving. She says to herself that she's glad she was reborn to master the blade. Chris talks about how it has always been her dream to fight a prismer. She gets confused about who to fight among the three opponents. Ronnie pulls Chris's ear and tells her that they have to go to the academy. Avel tells her to get going while he takes care of the masked man. He creates a shield and says the leader will be annihilated the moment he touches his magical shield. They dash at each other, and the masked man's spear enters the barrier and touches Ivel's shoulder. As soon as it touches him, the shoulder disappears. He attacks Avel till he disappears completely. Chris sees the masked man swing his spear and jump away with Ronnie. At the academy, the principal gives Leon and Lisa Lada orders to get the unconscious away from danger. Leon asks them to buy him time. The principal asks Yua to distract the prismer while she puts up a barrier. Yua tries to protest, but the principal yells at her. Yua walks to the monster and stiffens. She runs off while the monster chases after her. Leon strikes the monster and it pushes it back. Yua attempts to punch it, but she gets sucked in by the prismer. Miliera stops her from being sucked completely. Leon plans to blow up the entire area, but he notices the prismer charge up a beam attack in the direction of his sister and some students, so he interferes. Leon cancels the attack, but loses his armor. He picks up a knife and makes an electric sword out of it. Yua gets sucked in completely by the monster, but the principal assures her that she won't get absorbed for the time being. She confirms Ripple's status from Silva, who says Ripple isn't sucking any mana again. Silva asks if Ripple can join them after she wakes up, but Leon says she can't, since she'll still be weak. The prismer tries to leave their surroundings, but collapses. The principal notices it isn't a complete prismer and asks Leone to take the students into the pocket space. Leone does as she is told, leaving Miliera and her brother. The principal tells Leon that he is responsible for his safety. On the battleship, Ronnie urges Chris to join them at the academy. She sees the barrier around the academy and says everything will be fine. The spear transforms back into Rouge, who tells them that she's tired of their noise. Chris asks to fight them, but they decline her offer. They tell her that they've achieved their aim and they have noticed the prismer to be growing. The masked man advises the girls to leave as soon as possible. Chris feels disappointed and tells them that they'll see each other again someday. She and Ronnie are shown a flying gear that they can use to leave the battleship. The girls leave the battleship and head for the academy. Ripple wakes up and sees other students alongside her in the pocket dimension. She asks if they are okay, but Silva tells her that the last monster she summoned was a Prisma. Lisa Lata tells her that the Principal and Leon are staying in the pocket space to stop it. Ripple realizes that Leon is on their side, but she tells them that they aren't enough to stop the Prisma. She asks Leon to collapse her pocket dimension and help them. Leone agrees with her and does as she is told. They see Leon and Milira, who look worn out. Ripple engaged the Prisma. She gets knocked away by the Prisma and Silva offers to help her. The Prisma tries grabbing Silva, but she hits him out of the way and gets held instead. It squeezes her but Leon and Miliera rescue her. Ripple gets up on her feet and tries to fight but she falls. Silva asks her to become a weapon but she refuses. He tells her that he has always wanted to repay her for her kindness since she saved him when he was little. Ripple understands his plight, but she is forced without her consent into a weapon. Silva says he can feel her incredible power pulsing in the gun, and tries firing it at the prismer. Chris turns Ripple back into her beastkin form before Silva can pull the trigger. She says she made it just in time. Miliera complains because Chris broke her barrier to enter their location. The prismer gathers beams at its mouth to fire, but Chris leaps and kicks it upwards. The prismer points the beam at them and fires it. The beam spreads in all directions, but they get deflected before they can hit a target. They notice it was Inglis who deflected the beams. Chris smiles excitedly having her dream come true, but Miliera snaps her back to reality by informing her that Yua is in the monster. Chris runs toward the monster and tries attacking it, but the monster is incredibly fast. It pressures her with its attack and she goes on the defense. 
The people marveled that a human can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a prisoner. She is told that you all will soon be absorbed and tries to look for an opening. The girls join her and create an opening for her. Chris attacks the monster and sends it into the air. She fires a large beam made of ether at it, knowing it can't dodge it. Chris leaps and uses another ether attack on the monster and eliminates it. Chris jumps down with Yua in her hands and receives praise from her friends. Leon notices her brother leaving and smiles at him. Chris's stomach grumbles, and she says she wants to eat. They look for the cafeteria and realize that the whole school is in shambles. The principal tells them that they can eat as soon as it's rebuilt. Several days later, Silva carries plywood and orders Yua to join them. Yua says he didn't do anything, so he should get to do all the work. Silva gets mad at her and yells that he could have defeated the prisoner all on his own. Lisalot asks for the whereabouts of Chris and Rainy, and the principal tells them that the girls were summoned by the king. At the palace, Ripple and Chris discuss the repercussions of having Silva fire the prisoner. Chris realizes how the relationship between a holy knight and a Hyrule menace works. She says she realizes why Eris got so agitated when she met Ronnie. They see Ronnie running towards them, and Ripple tells Chris not to tell her about the repercussions. The girls meet with the king, and he congratulates them for saving the kingdom. He thanks Chris, especially for helping them against the Highlander and the Prismer. The king appoints Chris to be the head of the royal guards. Chris hears this and feels her purpose will be defeated if she accepts the honor, so she refuses. They walk out of the palace, and Ronnie asks her if she's sure of her choice. Chris tells her that she won't be able to stay by her side if she becomes the head guard. Ronnie sees through her and tells her that it's because she won't be able to fight at the front lines, and Chris admits to it. The king meets up with them and asks them to enjoy their feast. The girls accept and dig into the delicacies. They enjoy their lives at the academy after it's been rebuilt. 